Each November 20th, people across the world memorialize those that have been murdered as a result of transphobia. Rita Hester was an African-American transgender woman that was brutally murdered in her Boston apartment in 1998. She was 34 years old. Hester was stabbed 20 times, but managed to call 911 and stayed alive until police arrived. It took nearly an hour for her to get taken to the hospital, and she died of cardiac arrest from the stabbing. To this day, her murder remains unsolved. In 1999, Gwendolyn Ann Smith started a web-based project to memorialize the murder of Rita Hester. By 2010, TDOR was observed in 185 cities throughout more than 20 countries. From January 2008 to September 2020, 3,665 trans and gender diverse people were murdered in 75 different countries. These hate crimes disproportionately impact people of color and trans women of color. Of the reported killings worldwide, sex workers make up the majority of victims. Memorials include the reading of names of those who lost their lives from November 20th of the former year to November 20th of the current year. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted candlelight vigils, dedicated church services, marches and film screenings that would draw attention to this horrifying reality. The Transgender Day of Remembrance also serves as a way to create awareness on ending violence against trans and gender diverse people. Gwen Howarth is a facilitator for Gender Journey Brandt. She's also an illustrator, and she wanted to find a way to honor those that lost their lives in trans hate crimes. She has designed a work of art that will be displayed at the Brantford Public Library's main branch. Let's see, I, I think we were realizing that uh, November was coming up, and the, so the Trans Day of Remembrance, we normally do a... Um, an event like to memorialize um, those that were murdered over the past year. Um, and I, in, in the past we've done like read out uh, the names, we've written them on hearts or uh, put, put them on a map. And um, I, was, I was thinking this year, I'm like, we're, we always have these events that it's just the community and if we could get um, get more awareness out into the greater public. So making uh, I had this, I think I just, a tree and then uh, having the names on the leaves. Um, I don't think it was, I really, I kind of backwards planned it or, um, so I think it, hopefully I can say it was a subconscious thing maybe. Um, but uh, after looking into symbolism of, of trees and, and certain different types of trees, um, like an oak tree is uh, a symbol of courage and power and it stands strong through all things. Um, and uh, like I say, a pine tree is uh, uh, bending yet not uh, breaking, reaching the stars and, and eternal life, things like that. So you have many aspects of trees that are um, very uh, symbolic and it's, it's a, a strong symbol. Um, so um, yeah, and, and it's, it's something that uh, we could use uh, you know, in the future and uh, we can get it out there in the public and see it and, and uh, ask questions. So uh, this year we're uh, planning to have it at the Redford Public Library. Funding was made available for this project through the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario and the Grand River Community Health Centre. There's a lot of discussion about gender. And I think that a lot of times we don't, we don't know enough. We don't under, have a lot of understanding. And uh, I think it's important that we, we learn, we support, we go forward. The mental health of everyone involved is uh, key 
and in knowing that they are safe and included and loved and respected um, across our county, um, in our schools, uh, in our city of Brantford too. The Grand River Community Health Centre began a program called Gender Journeys Brantford. In 2014, Finn Cole took over leading the group, which is now known as Gender Journey Brant. Trans members of the community began taking part in the larger community by organizing events for Pride and then eventually TDOR. Grand River Community Health Center, um, we provide primary care services um, and integrate it with kind of a health promotion community development approach. Um, so it's really important to us to um, acknowledge social determinants of health. So social factors that may contribute um, to people's health outcomes. Um, and to kind of bring those things to the forefront. So one thing we really try to do is support um, groups who may have been traditionally marginalized in their community and to give them a platform or a space um, to find social connection, um, to find support um, and to access the services or whatever it is they may need. Um, so Grand River Community Health Center has been invo involved in supporting um, the LGBT community and the trans community in particular for many years now. Um, and our role in supporting um, Gender Journey Grant is in providing a space, um, staff support and resources um, for the peer group um, to kind of allow them to have a, a safe area or space to gather um, and to get what they need um, out, of, out of a peer support environment. So um, I think we're in a good position in the community um, to provide that support and be that space for people. Um, and I, I like that now um, Grand River has kind of become a gathering spot for a lot of folks in the LGBT community. Gender Journey Brandt approached Rogers TV to help share their personal stories. It's a way to bring to light the experiences trans and gender diverse people have in our community. Let's talk about your transition. You've been very open about sharing your story. Uh, tell me a little bit about when you started to, to realize this is something you wanted to do and, and what that transition was like for you. Um, I realized very, very early on when I was a kid, I had uh, two brothers, one sister. Um, my dad always wanted to be with, with, the, with, the, with his sons, building this and building that and so on that. I want nothing to do with it. You know, like, leave me alone. I'll stay inside with mom and my sister. Um, but it wasn't until uh, 20, 2014 is when I finally uh, made the decision. I went out to PEI with my dad to help move back to Ontario. Went out and spent two weeks as Erica. And I, then I came back and I thought, well, how can I not do this? So and then the, the, the process began. In this community in Brant, people are realizing there is a trans community here. Oh, and sure. What is it like living as a trans person in, in, in Brantford? For me personally, um, my personal experience is not what everybody else's is. Other people have not great necessarily experiences. For me, it's been awesome. Um, I haven't had any, well, I shouldn't say I had any. I had one, one incident uh, in front of my house that was not a pleasant experience. But other than that, you know, um, I just go out and do my thing and, you know, uh, be involved in different things. And uh, I've had no issues, really. So it's been awesome. That's great to hear. Um, and I know that's not always a story for many people. It's not. It's and not. it's definitely. Which is why we have to do things like this, to, to bring awareness and educate people and enlighten them and get them to understand that, you know what, we are just, you know, people like everybody else. So. So 22, I started my transitioning. I started hormones probably about a year and a half later. So in total, it's been about six years transitioning. Um, within those six years, a year after starting, I joined a group uh, for support, uh, Gender Journey Brand. And from there, um, I got a lot of help along my journey because I was going in not knowing anything. Um, I wasn't taught anything in school or anything about that. So I was very new. So I relied on that group a lot to help me through my journey. And uh, so now I'm four years on testosterone and I'm coming up on a top surgery date. 
definitely having uh, family and friends that are supportive uh, is it's 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 going to make uh, your transition like that much easier or harder. And if you have that support, it, it's 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 almost like night and day. Like I I think um, I've been so lucky and blessed with the the family and friends that are uh, definitely. Uh, in there for me and uh you know it, i mean it, there, it hasn't always been totally easy especially at the beginning it, there's uh, some growing pains but uh you know you, i think patience is is the best piece of advice i would give is you know um you may be starting to transition and you feel like you're just let out and you're ready you know you're just running a marathon, whereas everyone else has to catch up. So learning that patience and not pushing um, family or friends, you know, you, you have to give them time to accept um, the change. Trans individuals with disabilities face different barriers. Tyler is blind and Ty is deaf. They're both involved with Gender Journey Brand and have found support with their peers. You've transitioned, but you, you're you also deaf. And what is that like having that disability and going through the transition? So with being deaf, I have to rely on others around me to let me know what I sound like because I don't know what my voice sounds like. Um, so I'm always asking people, you know, do, what do I sound like? Do I sound... Uh, deep or, or high or what do I, um, but the problem with that too is that I don't know when I go into places that people are misgendering me. I have to rely on the people around me to, you know, let me know and, and advocate a bit for me to say, you know, that's not proper, which actually does happen um, in some places I go to. Um, because I'm deaf, they just won't, they think that it's okay to misgender me or, or use my old, uh, dead name, so. And you call it a dead name. Yes, it's a, it's a name that's no longer needed. <laughs> so before I came to Brantford, I was living um, out past Toronto. And I was like, I knew my community well enough, but I didn't know it well enough to be able to get myself to groups um, specifically for trans people. And then coming here, to Brantford has helped because of the school, they've been able to connect me. But then even still, like having to find transportation to even a doctor's appointment or like groups where I can meet up with other trans people is still hard because I just can't, I can't just decide, oh, I'm gonna go walk there because I don't know the area. like. I would get lost and then I'd have to depend on sighted people. And I mean, sighted people are awesome, but I just want to be independent. Like, I don't want to have to depend on people. And I guess the only way that I'm able to really achieve that is by using public transit. So there's definitely a higher cost to being a blind trans person, um, I'd say, because I can't just get up and go. I need to have things planned in advance. I need to either take months to practice a certain route or I need to depend on like Uber or buses to get somewhere. And like, I can't just say, you know, I'm gonna go to this thing tomorrow. I'm gonna go tomorrow and it'll be done. It's not, there's no magic switch. And I kind of wish there was. Um, but I guess the other big thing is like, I've been, asked well how do you have dysphoria if you're blind like okay i know my body i know i have a female body there's such thing as voice dysphoria like you can still be dysphoric when you have no vision it's just a thing and that's an interesting point it's a feeling for you right yeah, it's a feeling and then like, you know, knowing 
like that there's still, you know, I haven't done hormones. I haven't started hormones. So knowing that I still have the estrogen in my body and hearing my own voice, especially on interviews and recordings, um, because I'm into radio broadcasting a little bit. That's what I plan on doing for college. Um, hearing my own voice is just one of those things that I'm like, I can't. Many trans students feel unsafe at school and have been verbally and physically harassed because of their gender expression. One way to end transphobia is by educating the community. Have you felt supported within your school community or do you feel that maybe there's there's been a lack of understanding or even, you know, discrimination? I feel like um, as a blind person, I definitely depend on voices of people to know what their gender is. And a lot of the time assumptions come from come from people's voices. And so I'll be walking down the hall and a totally blind person will say, you know, like, hi, miss, or hi, like, like, you know, they'll refer to me as a girl because that's all they know. They don't, they don't know that I look masculine or am presenting like with masculine hairstyle, for example, or like, they just know my voice and that brings it back to voice dysphoria, but also in general, like the school has been great. There have been a few staff and of course I'm not gonna call them out by name. I'm not that kind of a person, but there have been a few staff that have refused to use my proper pronouns. And it's like, you know, why? But as a general like whole school community, 90% of the people have been very supportive and our school community is now, um, there's been like, I started it as the first trans person and now there's four people, including myself, who have come out. And I think the fact that I was the person to make that step was kind of, mind-blowing for me. Peer support is really important, but so are allies. So what does it mean to be an ally and why is it important? One of the things you talked about is there wasn't anyone to to answer your questions or help you through that. How important is it to have peer support and, and role models that you can look up to and go to for that type of support? It's very important because a lot of people Um, I know when I was transitioning, you know, it wasn't talked about. So I had to do a lot of my own research and some of the research wasn't up to date. And so um, when you look on on TV, even, you know, a lot of it is not for the everyday person transitioning. Um, But for me, it was um, important for this group because I was able to have realistic expectations and, you know, know what steps I should be taking um, and who to get in contact with, um, along with, you know, learning myself, you know, not to compare myself to others and to be realistic and just take things as they come and enjoy them as they're happening. Peer support, I think, acknowledges the fact that like many folks um, from different marginalized groups may in their day-to-day life not encounter um, other people who kind of identify with them. So for example, um, growing up as a trans person, you may not have the representation you need in your community um, to really figure out, you know, what's going on with your identity, um, where you can get the support you need. Um, So you just don't see that in your day-to-day life. So I think Peer support um, allows for people from a a group to gather and talk about their shared experiences um, and their shared identities or or whatever it may be, um, and acknowledges that no one knows your experience um, better (laughs) than than people from your own community. I think some of it is that there's a lot of fluidity um, in gender. Um, we have girls that don't like to wear dresses and we have uh, boys that want to play with dolls and 
you know, that it doesn't necessarily, uh, there's, a, there's a broad spectrum there. And when it starts at a young age, that understanding of um, people being who they are and accepting of others for who they are and loving them for everything that makes them them, um, then we come to accept the entire spectrum and those the stereotypes and the gender norms that are put on everyone are start to, to fall away. And that makes it safer. It makes it um, more accepting, more loving for everybody on that spectrum um, to be included and feel that they are valued for who they are. As, as kids get older, um, they, they start to recognize more about themselves. They start to understand more about themselves. And as they transition and change and start to explore other avenues of their own person, um, it's important that they know that there are safe places and that they are cared about and supported. As we wrap up our conversation, just yeah. one thing I wanna talk about is children and how important it is for them to learn at a young age about what, what transgender means and mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? I look at, you know, my own kids and then, you know, potential grandkids, you know what? You know, some people might fear, well, geez, so, you know, my grandkids might see me and go, oh, geez, oh, I want to be, like, be like Nana, you know, I'm going to be, be become a girl and so like that. And, you know, people don't do that. People yeah. don't, people don't become transgender because, you know, they think it's a cool thing to do. Like they, they, they don't, you know, I, you know, I certainly didn't go, geez, you know what? Wake up one day and go, you know what? I think I should become a girl. So that's, you know, so that, so that people can look at me weird and people can, you know, oh, what the heck's that? And so on. Like, you don't do it. You, you, you do it because that's who you are. That's who you are. You want to be yourself because being one person, although there's being, although there's challenges being transgender, being one person is so much easier than trying to live a dual life. Yeah. Oh, prior, prior to transitioning, you know, I had my, my say Erica girl side and I had my Eric boy side that, you know, you know, it, it's, it's hard. It's too much. It's and hard. nobody oh. should have to, to hide. It's much easier just, just being one person and being who you're supposed to be, be your, be your authentic self, you know, and that, and that can go for anybody in the, in the population. You know what? So I know that uh, one of our friends that uh, participate in one of our um, TVRs before Michelle Emson, she, um, I always talk about being being in a closet and smashing the doors down, and that's anybody, you know, like, like yourself or anybody who's gonna who's gonna watch this on TV. Anybody, everybody has something that they hide from from some people. They keep it in the closet because they're afraid of what other people's gonna think. You know what? Who really cares? Just be yourself. The work begins at home by supporting local transgender and LGBTQ organizations participating in local marches, candlelight vigils, and learning about the problems experienced by trans and gender diverse people. In Brant, we do not have a doctor that will treat trans individuals and provide them with prescriptions for hormone therapy. This means they have to travel outside of the community to get the help that they need. We've, when we can, we, we will try to give youth that uh, need to get to Quest, uh, Quest in St. Catharines. So we give them rides sometimes, but I mean, it's hard. So we, we, need, uh, we need more doctors that uh, will take on uh, trans patients in Brantford. So Gwen, you're an illustrator as well, and you've done a lot for comics. Can you talk about how you've brought that into um, this transgender journey? A few years ago, I did uh, uh, a couple pieces for Toronto Comics Anthology, and uh, they would run uh, some pretty successful Kickstarters for the books, and uh, they're pretty well known in Toronto. Um, so I, I, I think the first one I did was just kind of my coming out story, and it was it, it sort of paralleled with the. Uh, the way the trans march, the struggles it's had over the years and how it's sort of finally caught up with the rest of Toronto Pride. Um, and then the second sort of chapter I did, um, I think it was more the, the bathroom uh, subject and uh, the one year that 
it was World Pride, and I was using a bathroom at a Golden Griddle, I think, around the right around the corner from Church Street, which was like, you know, around midnight. It was a massive party going on, and this one girl gave me a lot of grief as I was coming out of an empty woman's washroom, and that was probably the the one you know time that I had uh, an incident like that so it was it was uh, distressing I guess from for me um, you feel discriminated against or alienated at any time or or still to this day um, when I first started out I had um, a problem with a, a drugstore getting the hormones um, I had gone in and asked, I put my prescription in and they said, okay. Uh, and it had been six months and they were saying, oh, it's going to be filled. It's going to be filled. And they never filled it because they don't agree with um, people transitioning. And uh, it, there was a, a lineup in the, this drug mart and they uh, spoke very loudly and was uh, to embarrass me while I was pre like starting the hormones. And when I finally got the prescription back, they told me, good luck finding a pharmacy that will fill that. Now I have, but it was very, when first starting out, it was, it was traumatizing. I can't even imagine. And I'm, I'm, I'm sad to hear that. And I'm sorry to hear that that happened. Do you think it's getting better? I know you talked about this being six years ago. Do you think it's getting better? I think the more we bring awareness and more we educate uh, the better it's coming. It's slowly, but the, like, I just think that the more education people get and um, the more the fear is gone, that it will make things a lot better. to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media.